Now that we spent some time talking about the ionic bond, let's focus on the other major type of bond, the covalent bond. So it wasn't really until the 20th century when chemists really began to understand this thing called the chemical bond. And the first guy who really thought about this, again, was G.N. Lewis. And this, again, was around the time of the ionic bond. So this is about 1918 again. And what G.N. Lewis thought was that a chemical bond involves electron sharing. by atoms. And so let's say if you have two fluorine atoms coming together, okay? And so fluorine, because it's in family 7A, is going to have seven valence electrons. This fluorine likewise would have seven valence electrons. So when the fluorines come together, those are the two electrons, or those are the two, yeah, those are the two electrons that would come together, and we would form a bond between the two fluorine atoms, okay? And so this is what the F2 molecule would look like. Now you can draw a bond using a line, and you remember that that line represents two electrons. You can also draw a bond like this. So I could draw as a set of dots between the two atoms, okay? And so either way is a legal move to show electrons to show that the electrons are shared between the atoms. Now these other things, these other dots around here, okay, so these are, you know, these are the shared electrons, these are the bonds. These other electrons that are around the, new, around the atom, these are the lone pair electrons. Okay, so we use lone pair electrons. These are the ones that help us determine shapes of molecules. The bonds are the ones the electrons involved in the bonds themselves are the ones that we're going to really study, but when we start looking in chapter 11 at the shapes of molecules, we have to use those bonding, those non-bonding electrons. So all that being said, let's get a working definition of a covalent bond. Okay, so a covalent bond. This is a bond in which the electrons are shared between two atoms. Okay, all right. And so like I said, you could use uh, you could use dots to show that bond. You could use the line. It's, it's, it's okay either way you wanna go. Just remember that if you use that line, which I'm most likely gonna do, uh, just remember that that dash, that line represents two electrons, okay? Now the other non-bonding electrons, we call those lone pair electrons. Okay, so the other non-bonding electrons are called lone pair electrons. Okay. These are not involved in covalent bonds. Okay, now when you have multiple atoms, so more than two atoms in a compound or a molecule, instead of drawing Lewis, bond, uh, Lewis line uh, dot structures like we're doing, we draw these bigger ones called Lewis structures. And so Lewis structures, these are a representation of covalent bo bonding. in which electron pairs are shown as lines or dots and lone pairs are shown as dots. Okay. 
Oops, hit that arrow. Sorry. Oops, I hit it too many. Hit it too much. All right, let me back up. All right, so sorry about that. Uh, Lewis structures, these are a representation of covalent bonding in which electron pairs are shown as lines or, or dots, and lone pairs are shown as uh, lone pairs are shown as a dot. Okay, so let's say we wanted to draw the Lewis structure for water. The Lewis structure would look like this. You're going to have two for water. You have two hydrogens and one oxygen. The hydrogen is going to be on either side of the oxygen, kind of like this. Now, since hydrogen has one valence electron, I'm going to put one dot next to hydrogen. Since oxygen is going to have six valence electrons because it's in family 6A, I'm going to, I know I'm going to have four, two on the top, two on the bottom, and then one on either side. Okay. And so you're going to have the hydrogen, each hydrogen and the oxygen share two electrons. Okay. Or to simplify it, we write the dot, we write the lines for the bonds, and then we put the dots in for the lone pairs. Now, this is really important. When we draw lone pairs, we've got to make sure that we draw not only the bonds, but also put in the lone pairs. Okay. So that's the Lewis structure for water. In the next video, I'm going to go over this in a lot more detail, and we're going to talk about how. How do we draw Lewis structure? So there's a set of rules that we have to follow. Now, for notice that in F2 in water, that each atom except for hydrogen gets eight valence electrons through sharing because that's a direct that's a direct rule from the octet rule. So let's talk about the octet rule again. So the octet rule says this: that an atom other than hydrogen. tends to form bonds until it's surrounded by eight valence electrons. Okay. Now this rule, the octet rule, is true for mainly period two elements. If you go to period three, you still want to follow the octet rule, but you start to get into some of the atoms, some of the elements that actually can violate the octet rule and still be happy. So we'll talk a little bit more about that as we're going. Now, one other thing that covalent bonds can do where ionic bonds can't is that atoms can actually form multiple bonds with atoms. So uh, we tend, what I've been drawing so far, these are single bonds where you have two atoms sharing one electron pair. Okay. You could also have a double bond where, again, two atoms and now you share two electron pairs. So that's four electrons. You can also have a triple bond, where you get two atoms, but three electron pairs are shared. So an example of a triple bond is nitrogen bonded to nitrogen. In order to make that work, you actually have to have three bonds between the nitrogens. Okay. For a double bond, what that would look like, carbon dioxide is a really good example where you're going to have carbon with the oxygens on each side and each oxygen is going to be involved in the double bond. Okay. Now there's one thing to note that as we go from a single to a double and from a double to a triple, that you're actually, as you increase the number of pairs of electrons that are shared, you actually start decreasing the length of the bonds between the atoms.
So if we take a look at uh, this chart over here, we actually can compare, <coughs> excuse me, we can actually compare the different sizes of the, of the bond. So uh, let's take a look at a carbon-carbon single bond that has a length of about 154 picometers. But as we go to a double bond, that length goes to down from 154 down to 133. And as we go from a double to a triple, we go from 133 picometers down to 120. So the nuclei are starting to move closer together. So the more electron pairs between the atoms, the closer the nuclei get. Okay. Now, so th there's a couple things that we got to talk about a little bit. So these numbers that I'm rattling off, this is bond length. Okay, so bond length, this is the distance between two nuclei. Okay, of two covalently bonded atoms. Okay, so that's, that's what we're looking at right here, this idea of bond length. Now, as we start looking at the going from the carbon single to the carbon-carbon double to the carbon-carbon triple, we see that as the bond lengths shorten, as the bond length decreases, the atoms move closer together. Okay. And so they tend to share more pairs of electrons. Okay. So another thing before we, we start getting into really covalent structures and Lewis structures, what are the differences between an ionic compound and a covalent compound? So let's take a look at two compounds. So we've got sodium chloride, which is going to represent the ionics, and then we've got carbon tetrachloride, which represents the covalents. Well, taking a look at, at the, the appearance, sodium chloride is a white solid, carbon tetrachloride is a colorless liquid. Okay, the melting point of sodium chloride is going to be 801 degrees Celsius, melting point of carbon tetrachloride, negative 23 degrees Celsius. Uh, if we take a look at boiling point, 1,413 degrees Celsius, boiling point of carbon tetrachloride, 76.5. So that's that's a great, that's definitely a difference there. So one thing that we can notice right off the bat, let me circle these numbers. So ionic compounds tend to have, I'm going to make a list over here, ionic covalent. All right, so what we can see is that ionic compounds have high melting points and boiling points. Covalent compounds have low melting points and boiling points. Okay. Uh, taking a look at sodium chloride, we saw that that was a solid. So ionic compounds tend to be solids. Covalent compounds could be liquids or gases depending on what we're talking about, okay? Uh, a couple other things that we can take a look at here. Electrical conductivity, solid for an ionic compound is, is poor, but if it's a liquid, it's pretty good. For carbon tetrachloride, doesn't really matter. It's still poor either way. So if you remember back at the beginning of the semester when we started talking about electrolytes, ionic compounds are strong electrolytes. So they're good conductors of heat and electricity. Okay, covalent compounds are going to be weak or non-electrolytes. And so they make poor conductors. Okay. Okay, before we go uh, talk about Lewis structures a little bit more, we got to come back and talk about electronegativity again. So um, 
this was about this was something that we talked about last week. But electronegativity. Remember that this is a measurement of how much an atom wants to pick up an extra electron in a bond. And more specifically, how much an atom wants to attract another electron in a chemical bond. Okay, so think of like I was, uh, think of electronegativity as a combination of ionization energy and electron affinity. Now, one of the things I said last week was that the difference in electronegativity helps us define what type of bond we're looking at. So now let's talk about this a little bit more. So the two types of uh, non-pol uh, the two types of covalent bonds that we have are the polar covalent, and then we have non-polar covalent. All right, so let's talk about this a little bit more. So in a polar covalent bond, the electrons spend more time in the vicinity of one atom over another. Okay, and in a nonpolar covalent, the electrons are shared relatively evenly. Okay, there's times where you know it may it may shift a little bit towards one atom, but for the most part, they're they're pretty much shared evenly. So, what we're looking at here, this kind of a picture is really awesome for for molecules. This is called an electropotential map. Or an EPM. Okay. And so what an electropotential map tells us is it's pretty much the density of electrons. So the darker red areas, this tells us, like over by the fluorine, this is going to be an electron rich region. Okay. And over by the hydrogen, where it starts to get a really darker blue, this is going to be an electron poor region. Okay. And so we have hydrogen and we have fluorine. Now, because of the coloring on this molecule, it looks like the, the electrons, the two electrons in that bond, okay, the electrons tend to want to go from the hydrogen to the fluorine. So the fluorine's gonna hold the electrons in that bond. They're gonna try, the fluorine's gonna really want those electrons badly. So to show that in a molecule, we've got two different ways of showing that, showing the electron flow. One way is to take that arrow that I just drew, okay? Uh, so we've got the, we started drawing an arrow from hydrogen all the way to fluorine. And so the head of the arrow, this is going to point to the atom that's really going to want the electrons badly. Okay. The hydrogen is going to be the, so the arrow, the head of the arrow is going to be the electronegative area, so the fluorine. The other end, the base, this is going to be your electropositive end. So to indicate the base, that this is the place that we're starting with, we usually turn that base into a, into a plus. So that indicates that we're looking at a more of an electropositive region. This is the area that the that the electrons are starting to starting from. Another way is to use the lowercase delta symbols. So we represent a lowercase delta plus on hydrogen to rep, to indicate that hydrogen, because of the shift of electrons, hydrogen tends to have a partially positive charge. And since the fluorine the electrons want to be around fluorine. We, we say that fluorine is going to have a partially negative charge. So we, we write a lowercase delta minus to indicate that this is, that the electrons tend to want to hang out around fluorine. All right, so that being said, um, now, one of the things I took, we, we took a look at last week, 
was I showed you a periodic table. I actually showed you the same picture from last week where um, we, we, we were really focusing on just the, you know, where is electronegativity increasing? Now, what's really cool is that we can actually, now that we know that these numbers exist, we can actually subtract these two numbers from each other, and that's going to tell us the type of bond that we're dealing with. Okay, so what I did was just box up the two atoms or the two elements in that, in that compound that we were looking at, the hydrogen and the fluorine, so it looks like fluorine has a value of 4.0, and then hydrogen had a value on the periodic table of 2.1, okay? So if we subtract 4.0 minus 2.1, okay, that's going to give us a difference. The answer is 1.9. Oh, see, my watch is even talking to us. So the answer was 1.9. So what kind of bond that tells us, this, this 1.9 actually tells us that this is going to be an ionic bond. So that's actually kind of nice, that the difference in electronegativity will actually indicate what kind of bond we're dealing with, okay? So uh, where I actually figured out that this is an ionic bond, let me give you those values. So if the difference between the two atoms is 0 to 0 0.4, we classify this as a nonpolar covalent bond. Okay, and in, in an, again, nonpolar covalent, the electrons are shared pretty much evenly. If the difference goes from 0 0.5 to 1.7, then this is considered to be a polar covalent bond. And so there's going to be a shift of electrons in that bond towards the more electronegative atom. Okay, if the difference is greater than or equal to 1.8, we consider that to be an ionic bond. And so based on these values, based on looking at this, you know, looking at these values, since that value that we just calculated over here was 1.9, that tells us that that bond between H and F is an ionic bond. Okay. All right. So now, now that we've cleared up some stuff, we've talked about the covalent bond. We talked about bonds. You know, you could have multiple bonds. We talked about electronegativity. Now what we're ready to do is start drawing some Lewis structures. So in the next video, that's what we're going to do. We're going to set out the rules to use for a Lewis structure, and then we're going to start drawing structures.